We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. Today we're going to remove a not so attractive iron stairway railing and replace it with a solid wood version that's much more handsome and inviting. Now, this is a job that's often left to a professional, but it can be a do-it-yourself project if you start, as I will, with a stairway kit. For the most part, the components are cut to size, ready to be assembled. I think you'll be surprised at how easily it goes together, and I know you'll be impressed with the end result. Now, what's the best way to paint window frames? Well, stay tuned and we'll find out. Well, what a beautiful day for traveling. I'm headed to St. Paul, Minnesota to visit Steve and Stacy Hecht. When they're not busy filling out adoption papers, Steve and Stacy are preparing a youngster's bedroom and child-proofing their house for the baby girl they will soon adopt from China. One area of special concern is the railing around the second-story stairwell. The wide space between the balusters is a hazard. So today, I'm here to help Stacy and Steve fix that problem in a very attractive way. And your concerns are what? Well, with the a couple of things. First, we can't really gate the end of the uh, stairwell off. And the second, we're really concerned about the width of right. the uh, of the rails. Right, right. Yeah, they're wide enough for a child to crawl completely through. Mm -hmm. And then some children, as they get a little older, can get their squeeze their body through here, but then they fall and they can catch their neck. So we definitely, when we put the new one in, are going to change the spacing on that. Mm. Our first step is to remove the old railing. It's attached to the floor with lag screws and to the wall the same way. Right, Good. There we okay, go. we're loose. Okay, Steve, let's just set this back here out of the way for now. Well, I've laid out all the components for our railing system right here. There, there are really only three. Uh, this is uh, a system by American Legacy. And the three major components are a newel post, a series of balusters in between. The newel posts will go at the top of the stairs and at the corner, a series of balusters in between. And the whole thing is connected together with the railing. Now, you notice that the newel post and the railing are in oak, because you guys have got a lot of oak in the house. I thought that would be nice. Right. But the balusters right here are actually in poplar, and these are designed to be painted. As Steve and Stacy clean the dust off each piece with tack laws, I temporarily nail the balusters to a strip of lumber so that we can turn our painting into an assembly line operation. As the couple get started on the balusters, I begin staining and finishing the oak railing. All right, Stacy, you want to grab that newel post there, and uh, we're going to get this ready to attached to the floor. These are just plastic food storage bags. I'm sort of putting them in here to keep from doing any damage to that new finish we put on here. There you go. That's the bottom end right there. This is the top. Just tighten this up a tad. All right, now the system that we're going to use to attach these guys involves the use of this metal plate. We're going to attach the plate to the bottom of the post and you see how it overhangs here and here? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to attach these ears to the floor. To attach the plate, we have to drill a pilot hole dead center in the bottom of the newel post. A special center finder attachment on my combination square makes locating the center as simple as drawing two diagonal lines. Good. Nice work. Next step is we'll be attaching this plate right here. Now this can be just a little bit tricky, but I can show you a couple things that'll make it go easier. You know, driving a large screw like this into hardwood like this oak can be kind of tough going, but here are a couple of tips that'll make it easier. First of all, be sure you choose the right driver tip for your drill. Did you know that there are three different size fillet bits? A number one for very small screws like this, a number two for medium-sized screws, and a number three for large screws like the one we're about to drive in. You can always tell the number three bit because it's got sort of a blunt end right here. 
Secondly, try lubricating the screws, either with soap or wax. In this case, the threads run the full length of the screw, so we're going to wax them all the way from one end down to the other. Now that we've got the right bit for the right screw, we got our threads lubricated, this should be fairly easy going. Now, I want to make sure that this is square with the edge of the stairwell, so I'm going to take a carpenter square to slip it in here. I align one edge of the square with the edge of the stairwell while Stacy adjusts the post. I've outfitted the drill with a flexible shaft that will allow us to get close enough to the post to bore pilot holes into the floor. Steve then drives in a couple of screws to temporarily hold the post in place. In a little while, we're going to remove the newel post, then reinstall it with the railings attached. Now, this is called a rosette. We're going to mount this on the wall, and the handrail is actually going to terminate in the center of this. To figure out where that should go, I took a level, and I transferred this rectangular shape right here over to this wall, found the center of that, and then used the center of that to draw this circle. Now, it's time to actually attach this rosette, and we're going to do this with a toggle bolt. So first of all, let me put this in position now this is the bolt from the toggle bolt. I'm going to put that in the hole, just like that. And then I'm going to give it a little tap with a hammer. Okay. Give myself a reference mark right there. And then I'm going to bore out a hole, in this case, large enough so that the toggle can slip through. Next, I insert the bolt through the rosette and screw on the toggle. Then I pinch it closed and push it through the hole. The toggle will flip open inside the wall. As I tighten the bolt, I pull the rosette away so the toggle will come into contact with the back side of the wall. This will prevent it from spinning. Our railings need to be cut to length, so Steve and Stacy begin taking measurements. About 35 and a half. 35 and a half. Okay, now come down and measure from that newel post to this one here. Okay. You got it? Yep, got it. What do you got there? About 105. After recording our measurements, we move outside to start cutting. Nice job. Class A cut right there. Beginner's luck. Floor. Uh, it's going to lay right in here like this. And what's going to happen is these balusters eventually are going to sit on top of this. Sometimes these would go right into a finished floor, but you don't have a finished floor here because of the carpet, so we're going to put this down instead. We secure the tow rail to the floor with finished nails. Have you ever driven a nail easier in your life? I haven't driven many nails in my life, but I'm willing Whoa, to say that was really? the easiest one I've driven. Because pencil marks can be difficult to see on dark wood, I've placed masking tape on top of the tow rail and make our measurement marks on it. Spacing is an important thing here. There's a little formula that I use to come up with the spacing, and then once I figured out what the spacing should be, I made up a little block like this, just as a marking gauge, and then just moved this along like so and made a mark so at the right interval. Each one. Exactly. Now, uh, I'm going to turn these bottoms aside up for just a second because I want to show you something. The final check here, though, is I'll put these on the marks, is that we want to make sure that the space between the balusters um, at the widest point is no more than four inches. That's the maximum for child safety. So that would be right here, and we're about three and seven eighths inches, so we're okay. Now, uh, these are actually going to get installed with this pin right here downward. That means that we've got to drill holes every place we've got a mark right here. We finish drilling all of our baluster holes, but before we set the balusters in place, we have to first attach the handrails. I've applied masking tape to the railing and the newel post, drawn center lines on each, and aligned them. Then using a few balusters to temporarily support the handrail, I trace the shape onto the newel post. Next we need to drill a very accurate hole into the side of the newel post. A portable drill press accessory allows me to bore a perfectly straight hole. All right, 
one hole. Now this is uh, called a hanger bolt. You see it's got two threads on it. It's got a coarse thread here, kind of a screw thread, and a machine thread out here. Mm -hmm. And this is actually what's going to hold the handrail to the newel post. Okay. We'll install it by getting a good grip with the vice grips like this. Right in the middle? Right in the middle. Well, I can see now why it was important to be squared up. Yeah. Can okay. I get one yeah, more? You can go it? one. Yeah, just whatever, to just as just long as you don't scrape the finish there. That looks good. About right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Next, we secure the railing on the workbench and bore a hole into the end. For this, I've added a piece of wood to the drill press base to make it more stable. Then, using a larger one inch bit, I drill a second hole into the bottom of the handrail that will intersect the first. Now it's time to connect the railings to the newel post. This is the hanger bolt that we put in earlier. This is the hole we drilled in the end of the rail and the larger one that we drilled in the bottom. We'll slip this hole over the hanger bolt like that. Now inside this larger hole, I'm going to slip this washer. It's actually got a convex surface on here that'll form to the edge of the hole. Now that gives me a flat surface on which to install this combination nut washer. And the best way to put this in is with this special wrench that comes with the kit. Slip it in like this, and then we tighten it up. With the railing attached, Steve and Stacy set the base of the first newel post on the floor and slide the end of the handrail over a hanger bolt we installed earlier in the center of the rosette. Stacy then slips on the washer and nut. Okay, baluster number one in. So just put that base, the pin on the bottom, in the holes that we drilled earlier. Okay. There we go. And tip it to me. I'm going to okay. lift this up just a little bit so you can slide it up there. We continue installing the rest of the balusters by inserting the bottom pins into the tow rail holes and sliding the heads into a slot on the underside of the handrail. Rail number two, newel post number two. With all our balusters in place, we screw the newel post plates to the floor, this time for good. Finally, we tack small finished spacers called fillet strips into the slot on the underside of the handrail between each baluster. These help hold the tops of the balusters in position. We further secure them by toenailing. Put your fingers. Well, what do you think? Oh, it looks great. Ron, it looks I absolutely love great. how the oak contrasts with the white, and the fact that it's safer to boot is just icing on the cake. Yep. Right. It was a lot of fun. Learned a ton about how to back tow uh, the banisters, and, and actually, as we put each of the screws in, how it really took shape and really became solid. So. You, know, you know, you see these all the time. You really don't have any sense of how they really go together until you actually build see them. See the final product. It's really so. an ingenious mm -hmm. system. It's yep. all set up now for your child gate. Yes. Speaking yes. of child, here's a little something for the, oh my the new goodness. one. As if this oh, is a welcome present baby enough. present. Yeah. Thank my you very goodness. Much. Well, congratulations, Steve and Stacy. You know, there are so many reasons to improve our homes, and safety, especially child safety, is one of the most important. But isn't it great when a project like this one not only protects children, but also makes the space look so much more attractive? These days, there are a lot of alternatives to a wood-burning fireplace. For example, have you thought about electric? Electric fireplaces come with pre-built surrounds and mantles. They slide into place, plug into any standard outlet, and with the flick of a remote control, produce a fairly realistic-looking flame. Electric fireplaces are not just for looks. They have heaters and fans that can add a nice bit of supplemental warmth. There's no simpler way to add the ambiance of a fireplace to just about any room. Many of today's gas fireplaces come with mantles simply set in place and are vent free. These two are available with remote controls that produce real flames and some serious heat at the touch of a button. Vent free gas fireplaces are equipped with oxygen depletion sensors that shut down burners in an emergency. When it comes to heat output, Pellet stoves are real heavyweights, putting out up to 25,000 BTUs per hour. 
Pellet fuel is made from compressed wood waste, such as sawdust and wood chips. Many pellet stoves have thermostats and start automatically with the turn of a switch. In minutes, they reach room warming temperatures. Typical fuel costs for a heating season run around $600, and a single stove can heat as much as 2,000 square feet. Pellet, electrical, then free gas. Three fireplace options that are clean, convenient, and economical. You know, one of the most time-consuming and often frustrating parts of a paint job are dealing with window panes like these. The question often is, do you spend time up front putting tape on the glass so you don't get so much paint on, or do you go ahead and paint and then scrape off the dried stuff afterward? Well, actually, I'm going to show you the best techniques for doing both, and then you can decide. If you choose the taping method, you'll need three things. Some masking tape like this, inch and a half wide is a good width. A putty knife, about two to two and a half inches wide would be my choice. And a file. That's right. Why? Because we're going to actually sharpen the putty knife to make it work better for us. Let me show you how. Lay the putty knife on the edge of a workbench or table. Hold your file in the other hand and then pass it over the edge of the putty knife like this. After a few times, stop, turn the putty knife over and do the other side. Next, tear off four pieces of masking tape that are a little longer than you need. Put the first one on the top of the pane, like that. Put the second one on the bottom. Then take your putty knife and cut both of these a little short on each end like that. Take the two remaining pieces of tape and put them down the sides. Make sure you go right up to the edge. Then once again, take your putty knife Place it right up in the corner and tear them off cleanly like this. That's about as fast and accurately as you're going to do that. Well, now let's paint with tape and without. Well, the paint's dry. Now it's time to clean up. Let's start with the window that we didn't tape. Now, the way to get this paint off is with razor blade. We're going to actually make one cut right where the glass meets the wood frame like this. And then we're going to use this tool, which is a little holder for our single edge razor blade. And we'll go in and we'll start peeling this back. The idea is that cut that we made first will help this to break away a little more cleanly. Well, the scraping worked pretty well. Took quite a while, though, to get that paint off the glass. Let's put the tape to the test. Now, before we peel it off, I'm going to take one of these breakaway knives and just go around the edge here. I want to cut through any paint seal between the edge of the tape in the window frame. Now, for the moment of truth, let's see how the tape does. We'll start peeling this off. Well now, which method do you like best? On one hand, we did spend some time putting the tape on the glass, but I think it was less time than I spent scraping the dried paint off the glass up here. And I didn't have to be quite as careful. So I'd say that tape has my vote. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com. Step-by-step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.